Good morning. Well, whether you're joining us online or whether you're here in person, let's prepare our hearts for worship today by hearing from our call to worship. As we are encouraged in Christ, comforted from love, and led by the Spirit, let us have the same love and mindset towards each other. In humility, count others as more significant than yourselves, looking not only to personal interests, but also to the interests of your sisters and brothers in Christ, and in so doing, becoming more like Jesus Christ. That's the hope of our community. And with that hope in mind, let's stand and let's sing hymn 234, Crown Him with Many Crowns. O oh, Comforter in sorrow, we are so in need of prayer. We do not know how to be good stewards of your world. We fight with our neighbors. We covet each other's possessions. We squander the good gifts that you have given us. Heal us, O oh Lord, so that your church can be a healing agent. Cut through our denial, Jesus, and work in us your humanity, new humanity. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, Swain Napier, uh, Mary Ellen's understudy. So I have more room to make an error with the announcements. Um, a couple of PSAs. Uh, first, I want to mention that uh, in the pews, there are prayer request cards. If you have any prayer requests or, or needs, you can just fill out one of these cards and drop it in the offering plate. And if you are visit us for the f visit us, uh, visiting us for the first time, welcome. There's also a visitor's card which you can fill out and then someone from the church's office will contact you. Uh, but um, we have a couple more. Pack your picnic lunch and come up to uh, Beer Mountain on Saturday, September 25th, which is this coming Saturday. Enjoy some fun with your church family. We will meet at the picnic area by the lake at 11. You can contact the church office or uh, Mary Lang if you need to carpool or you just need additional information. Secondly, uh, we're hosting a uh, women's night on Friday, October 1st, uh, from 7 to 9 p.m. We'll be having uh, some, uh, you know, get to know your games and activities, desserts, and a testimony from one of our sisters in the church. Uh, invite a, a friend for that uh, night of uh, good fellowship. And uh, last but not least, uh, we also want to say thank you to the BRE for hosting last week's picnic, and thank you in a special way for. Uh, Mike, who is the, the grill master, always a blessing, he's always helping out. Uh, I think that's all we have. Uh, thank you. Good morning, church. Good morning. So I'm here representing the missions committee. Um, during this month of September, we are taking up special offerings uh, to support international missionaries. The missions committee has taken the time and the effort to vet various missionaries that are doing work all over the globe. Um, we were vetting them based on uh, the work that they were doing. Are they sharing the love of Christ? Are they sharing the gospel message? And are they willing to be in communication with us? Are they willing to get on Zoom calls and interact with our children so that our children can understand what's going on in the rest of the world and develop those kind of relationships? Are they willing to stay in communication with us and to let us be part of the ministry? Are they willing to allow us to show up in their, in their space, in their ch churches in Mexico or Thailand and be part of what they're doing? So there was very specific criteria by which we were scoring the various missionaries that we were interviewing. There was one group that I would like to highlight today. It's a young couple in northern Thailand. I believe that we have the ability to run a video on it, but before we do, let me just say a couple of words. They have three thrusts within their mission work over in northern Thailand. One is an orphanage where they have children most of the young boys in the orphanage were abused, and so they're being saved from a family of abuse. 
the women in the orphanage, the young girls in the or orphanage, were fodder for sex trafficking. And because they're able to be in the orphanage, they're being saved from being sex trafficked. So as you listen and as you think about what they're doing within the orphanage, let me just put a number on it. If you found $1,000 that is one child that is able to live and be fed and clothed and be educated in this loving Christian environment and saved from either abuse within a family environment that doesn't love them or from being sold into the sex trade. The second ministry that they're actively involved in is the local village, which is near the orphanage. They've created a church and many of the people in that village are being saved and converted and coming to know the love of Christ through the presence of that local church. The third mission effort that they're doing is that they have set up a new church in Chiang Mai to reach the young people in that northern area of Thailand. Many of the people that live in this area of Thailand are from a community called the Shan community. So the Shan community is a group, an ethnic group that does not have its own country. It's southern Burma and northern Thailand. So as you watch the video, there will be a young couple that is the young couple that we have Zoomed with. That's the young couple that we have interviewed with. That is the young couple that has been empowered by Christ to spread the gospel. With that, if you can run the video. Over 2,000 years ago, a light came into this world. The night was marked by a bright star shining in the heavens, calling to those near and far. The light came unexpectedly in the form of a baby. The weary world rejoiced, for the light meant hope. And though the darkness of the world was great, it could not overcome that great light. No matter how hard they tried, they could not put it out, and they never will. To this day, we carry that light with us. Our task, our commission, is to bring that light to where it is darkest. There are over 8.5 million Shan people in Asia. Their culture is rich, from their language, to their festivals, to their food. But for years, a darkness has covered them. Held captive by the traditions of Buddhism and the stronghold of animism, less than 1% are Christian today. They are an estranged people, countless Shan people fleeing from their home state in Burma for safety or resources elsewhere and darkness follows them. Hard labor and lack of identity has taken its toll. Drugs and alcohol, their only solstice. Broken families litter their communities, wrought with addictions, abuse, and divorce. It seems hopeless. But where there is darkness, a light can shine the brightest. Matthew 5, 15 through 16 says that God has made us light bearers, set up on a light stand, letting our light shine before others. 
they will see our good deeds and glorify our Father in heaven. If the Sean people were to look now, what would they see? They would see us visiting their broken homes and taking in their orphaned children. They would see us preparing them for a brighter future. They would see us bringing the good news to their communities, going where others would not go, to the darkest corners of this country. They will see this great light, and they will glorify our Father in heaven. We believe that Jesus is the only hope for the Sean people, and our mission is to bring Jesus, the light of life, to those in darkness. excited for you to join us. So as God's people, we are called to do justice and love mercy. Lindsay and Sean are the young missionaries in Northern Thailand. They have committed to us to be accountable, to talk to us regularly about their ministry, about the number of conversions that they are having, the number of people that they are reaching, the number of people that they are visiting, what they are doing. So we feel very good about what they're doing and their openness and willingness to be accountable and to communicate with us. If you would like to partner with them, then you need to contribute. You need to pray for them. You need to give financially, and we as a church have committed to them as they've committed to us. There's an envelope that you have in your bulletin. You can put a check in this if you want. You can also just write a check and just put mission at the bottom of it. You can get online. As long as you mark the word mission, your giving this month will go to support the international missionaries, one of which are this young couple, Sean and Lindsay, in northern Thailand that are doing the work of Christ. Thank you. Good morning, church. Today's first reading is from Philippians 4, verses 2 to 9, and is in the New Testament section of your Pew Bible on page 198. I urge Euodia and I urge Syntyche to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes. And I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they have struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, 
if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing this, the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. This is the word of the Lord. As individuals, we have an opportunity to pray throughout the week between us and God because we don't need a mediator. We have one in Jesus. But every week as a community, we have a, a chance, an opportunity for all of us collectively to bow our heads and to pray together and to direct our thoughts and our, our, our minds towards God. And so let's do that today. Please bow your head as we pray together. Oh Lord, you teach us to pray in Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain against the Lord and against his anointed? And so, Jesus, as the anointed, we come to you in a moment when the nations seem to rage, whether it's Afghanistan or China, Australia, France, Britain, even the U.S., Lord. The world seems stretched thin and tensions seem high. Internally, as citizens of this wonderful country, it feels like our politics at times are also raging taking our bonds of unity and weakening them. As we read the news, Lord, whether it's national or international, what are we to do but to wonder at the raging of the nations? What are we to do, Lord, but to pray to you? And so we ask you now, King Jesus, to give us an abiding sense of your peace. You are in control. You are sovereign over all nations. You are enthroned above history, and you will be glorified in all of it. Equip us now as your church for this cultural and historical moment to be people of peace, to be people of reconciliation. And for those, Lord, in our community and in our country who experience real anxiety over world events, Lord, please give them an abiding and surpassing peace. Lord, we also lift up, to the, lift up today those who worry, not because of what is happening, happening externally, Lord, but those who worry because of what's happening internally, whether it's in their families or in themselves. Where marriages are struggling, Lord, we pray that you strengthen them. Where depression grows in people's mind, Lord, we pray that you work in them to bring them hope. Where work overwhelms us, Lord, we pray to give those people strength, and where health fades, Lord, I pray that you bring healing and restoration. We lift up all of those who are ailing in our communi community, Lord. We ask you to heal their bodies. And last, Lord, we pray for those who grieve, especially, Lord, the Snyder family who grieves the loss of Bruce this week. Lord, to be apart from the body is to be with you. And so we celebrate in some way this reality that Bruce is with you and his tears are now wiped from his face, and his body no longer aches. But we partner with the Snyder family, and we mourn with them, we weep with them as they, as they mourn the loss of a dear father and husband and grandfather. Be with that family this week and this month, Lord. Surround them with your care. Jesus, we lift up all of these prayers to you in your name today. Amen. All right, let's stand and continue our time of worship by singing hymn number 379, Take My Life.
morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Our New Testament lesson is taken from Matthew chapter 18, verse 15 to 20, can be found on page 20 in the New Testament section of your pew Bibles. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault just between the two of you. If they listen to you, you have won them over. But if they will not listen, take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. If they still refuse to listen, tell it to the church. And if they refuse to listen even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth agree about anything they ask, for it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am with them. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, church. Let's just begin with a, uh, a historical reference point. In 1910, a man named Bogdan Zarajic, out of frustration, attempted to assassinate the Austro-Hungarian governor of Bosnia. His frustration was over this reality that he thought Serbs should be able to run their own life and their own affairs. He failed in that attempt. And one, if looking from the outside, would just think, this is simply an... Uh, an outlier. It's, it's a small act of anger in Eastern Europe. It shouldn't really have much of a, an effect on an, anyone, right? Anger, that anger should just stay there. And yet, Bogdan Zarajic inspired a new generation of very disenfranchised and frustrated Serbs. And one of these men who he inspired with his violence was a guy named Gavrilo Princip. And he hung on to that anger for four years, from 1910 until 1914, trying to understand a way in which he could assert his own authority as a young man. He was inspired by this kind of anger that Bogdan Zarajic had. In June of 1928, sorry, in June 28 of 1914, Gavrilo Princip found his idea for how he would actually express his anger. In Sarajevo, in Sarajevo, he was able to assassinate a reigning member, a ruling member of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. This man's name was the Archduke Ferdinand, and his murder, in many ways, was considered to be the match that lit the powder keg that was the world's first world war. In this war, 8.5 million soldiers died. In this war, 13 million civilians died. And all of it because one man named Bogan Zarajic had the audacity to try to assassinate someone in his anger. I think this history lesson begs a very interesting question of all of us. When we're angry and we just sweep our anger under the rug, what happens to it? Does it slowly but surely dissipate or does it grow? As I have watched friends and loved ones deal with deep-seated anger issues, whether it's towards family or whether it's towards employers, I have found this to be true, that anger, when untreated, tends to grow more and more and more. And we see this in the the law of atrophy. A tire that is worn, if left and gone uncared for, eventually becomes a flat tire on the highway and maybe even causes an accident. A shoelace, when it's not properly tied, becomes a fall and maybe even a trip to the hospital. Things, when left ignored, often don't go away. They simply get worse in the dark. And I think this begs a question for each and every one of us. What are we to do with the anger that we experience in our daily life? What, what, What are we to do with the frustration that we experience, whether it's in work or in family or maybe even possibly the church? What do, we, are, what do we to do when we can't get along with someone? This is the issue that Paul is dealing with at the beginning of Philippians chapter 4. 
As we're reading through Philippians chapter 4, it feels like he's beginning to tie up loose ends and he's beginning to wrap up his letter to this church. And one of his main priorities is making sure that a pair of church leaders, two very powerful women leaders in the church, one of the things he wanted to do, to, to do is make sure that they had buried a hatchet between them. They had a disagreement. These two women were Euodia and Syntyche, and for whatever reason, they disagreed. And Paul wanted to make sure that these two leaders in the church were able to make amends with each other because Paul knew, Paul knew, that things, when left undealt with, don't get better. In fact, they get worse. What do we do when we can't get along with someone in the church? This is what we're speaking about today. And the, I think our first two steps as we talk about this topic is, is simply to destigmatize the question. As I've been wrestling with this, this question this week, and even talking with a few individuals this week, there see, this, this question seems to be loaded with a certain amount of guilt. It seems to be freighted with a certain amount of moral confusion. People feel bad when they have to talk about what it looks like or what it means to, to deal truly with reconciliation in the church. And I think one of the issues with this, with this is, is just the, the fact that oftentimes we associate churches who can't get along with failing churches or with bad churches. And I, I want to completely get over this, this misconception. I think we need to destigmatize this, this conversation for any church. How to get along with people we can't seem to get along with is, is not a, a problem for bad churches. It's not a problem for failing churches. It's a problem for any given church that has existed in the history of the church. And anytime churches have to get together in a room and make a decision about how they are going to spend money or what the vision of the church is going to be, inevitably disagreements are going to arise. Even the healthiest churches have to learn how to deal with this. And I think in, the, in, in, in our beginning stages of this conversation, we need to draw a very important distinction. There's a very big difference between disagreement and what we do with our disagreement. But disagreement itself isn't itself sin. It's not wrong to disagree with someone in the church. And Paul, in fact, tips his, his hat to this as he talks to Euodia and Syntyche. If you want to turn to Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, we, we, we see him actually deal with this fairly directly. And this is what he says in Philippians 4, 2. I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. And I want you to underline that phrase, in the Lord. I want you to note there what the Apostle Paul doesn't say. He doesn't say, I want you to, to agree on this topic. He doesn't say, I want you to agree, to agree on the theological sticking point that you're having an issue over. He doesn't say any of that. It's not wrong that these two leaders within the church disagree. That's fair. That's going to happen in any institution, anytime human beings are together. I mean, you have the saying that where there are three Christians, there are four different opinions. I mean, this is just in, in the nature of being a human or in the nature of being part of the church. Disagreement isn't of itself a bad thing. It's what we do with the disagreement. Paul asks for agreement, not in terms of the topic, but in terms of how they deal with the situation. He asks them to agree, and underline this phrase, in the Lord. The issue at hand wasn't the main sticking point for Paul. The issue was, are they modeling Jesus' love? Right? That's what it means to agree in the Lord. Paul doesn't care about whether they agree in their decision. Paul doesn't necessarily care about whether they agree in the nuances of their theology. He agree, he, he, his, his sticking point is, are you loving each other in your disagreement? It's perfectly fine for good and godly Christians to disagree at times. And so this topic isn't a topic for bad churches. It's not a, a topic for failing churches. It's a topic for any given church where disagreement just happens to, to go on. This is normal life in the church. I want to completely destigmatize it. it. This is not a bad conversation for us to have as a church. And yet at the exact same time, I want to prioritize this conversation because Paul prioritizes this conversation. Paul knows that even small divisions within the church can become a flashing point. And where issues become a flashing point, people tend to take sides. And where people tend to take sides, churches begin to divide. Our anger, when swept under the rug, doesn't just go away. It grows. It festers like an infection. And so what Paul wants to bring it out into the light so that the church can deal with it directly. 
In Philippians 4, we see Paul taking on this issue of church division as an important topic for every church to, to wrestle with. And we don't just find Paul talking about this in Philippians. He talks about it in almost every single letter that he writes. This is a, a big issue for the Apostle Paul. He wants to make sure that his churches are living in harmony and living in peace with each other. And so, for instance, we see the seriousness with which Paul takes church division in Galatians chapter 5. So if you want to put your finger in Philippians 4 and just flip a few pages to, to Galatians chapter 5. And if you want a, a helpful mnemonic device for how to remember Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, I always just say, go eat popcorn. That, that, that's just how I always remember it. And so anytime you see me looking up a, 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 a book in the Bible, you can just think, Pastor Dan is saying to himself, go eat popcorn. He's trying to remember where Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians is. And so we're going to flip a few pages back to Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. And here Paul is talking about the difference between the works of the flesh and the works of the Spirit. And the works of the Spirit are beautiful. It's love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, all of those. They're beautiful and we think to ourselves, the work of the flesh has, has to be everything that's opposite to that. It's drunkenness, it's sex, it's smoking cigarettes, it's doing all sorts of things. And wouldn't you know it, Paul doesn't necessarily strictly highlight those things. He also highlights some other characteristics that we wouldn't necessarily associate with works of the flesh. If you read Galatians 5.19, you'll see 15 different things that he lists. And I think it's amazing that of the 15, seven deal with relational dynamics within the church. Seven of the works of the flesh deal with things that divide the church. Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissension, divisions, and envy. Paul sees potential conflict within the church, and he deals directly with it. Because when the church is not existing together in harmony, okay, this doesn't mean perfect agreement, but it means perfect harmony. When the church isn't existing together in harmony, preferring the needs of other people over themselves, this is an issue that could become a flashing point that could grow into a rift that inevitably divides the church. And Paul sees that as fundamentally something that goes against the Spirit of God in almost all of Paul's letters. He's wrestling with this issue of what it looks like for good, godly men and women who want to follow Jesus, what it looks like for us to actually live together in harmony. Our divisions have the capacity to divide the church. And so practically speaking, like, what, what, what are we to do? I mean, I, I bet all of us have had an instance in the church where there's just someone that for a season, we just, we just don't see eye to eye with them, and that's totally okay but practically speaking, what, what are we to do as believers in Christ? I, I would bet that many of us are conflict averse, meaning that when we're in conflict with someone, we prefer to just ignore it, sweep it under the rug, and hope that it just inevitably goes away. And this can be in our marriage, this can be in our workplaces, this can be in our friendships, and this can also be in our churches. Good, wonderful, nice Christians who don't who don't want to be overly controversial, what, what do they do when conflict arises? They just sweep it under the rug and they hope it goes away. But history teaches us time and time again that conflict, when it's left unresolved, doesn't just go away. It grows and it festers into other things. And so Paul speaks directly into this issue, and I think he gives us three pieces of wisdom I always want to stay away from giving from rules. There aren't rules to how to deal with conflict. There's wisdom to how to deal with conflict. Paul in Philippians 4 gives us three wonderful pieces of wisdom for how to deal with conflict within the church. And here they are. They're going to be the three points for today's sermon. The first point that Paul wants to make for resolving conflict is this. He wants us to assume shared guilt. He wants us to assume shared guilt. The, th the second thing that Paul wants us to do when dealing with conflict is this. He wants us to assume that Jesus died for the person that we are in conflict with, with which is such an annoying principle, but it's true at the same time. Paul, Paul wants us to assume that Jesus died for the person we're in conflict with. And last, and certainly not least, Paul wants us to assume that sometimes, in certain cases, we need other people to actually help us sort it through. We need a third neutral party to help us sort it through. And those are going to be the three points for today's sermon. So let's just jump into that first point. The first thing we need to do is we need to assume shared guilt. Like I have found, whether it's in conflict with friends, 
conflict with coworkers, or even conflict within my family, I have found that there is rarely, there's very, very rarely such a thing as someone who is 100% right and someone who is 100% wrong. And one of, one of my best learning moments was actually about six years ago when I was in my premarital counseling with Tiffany. We had a premarital counselor named Susan, and she was tough as nails. Man, that woman kicked my butt for like two months straight, and it was like the best thing for me. Because here is what I had the habit of doing when I was in conflict with someone. I, I had the habit of creating this instantaneous narrative within my brain. The moment I was in conflict with someone, I could identify the 10 reasons they were wrong, and I could find the, the 100 reasons why I was right. I created a narrative within myself that demonized them and made myself look like an angel. And Susan, my counselor, showed me that that is fundamentally going to cause rifts between me and whoever I'm in conflict with. There's never such a thing as me being 100% right and someone else being 100% wrong. It's always 50-50. And my premarital counselor gave me the wisdom of saying, Dan, when you're in conflict with someone, what you need to do, your job is not to identify all the ways in which your spouse is wrong or in which your friends are wrong. Your job is to find the ways in which you are wrong because you you're at least 50% at fault. And so my job as a husband was to find at least the 50% that I was wrong. Oftentimes it's more than 50%, but it was, it was to find the, the, the at least the 50% that I was wrong, to identify it, to own it, and then to repent of it. And immediately when I do this, whether it's in a family situation or a professional situation, I just see walls come down. I see reconciliation happen quickly. And I find it so interesting that Paul operates out of this same basic assumption. And you see this actually, and this is going to get a, a little bit geeky, I apologize, but you actually see this when you look at the Greek grammar of, of, of Philippians 4 verse 2. So let's just look at it very specifically. When you read it in English, you see two verbs that happen here. And these two verbs are just, they just read very oddly. So Philippians 4 2 says this, I entreat you, Odia, and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. And I want you to see those two verbs, entreat. In normal Greek grammar, you, you just never phrase something like this. You have a verb, and then you have an object. I entreat Euodia to get along with Syntyche. And in that verbal construction, it means Euodia is the one that's wrong, and uh, Syntyche is the one that's been, been, that's been harmed, and that Euodia has the full responsibility of patching, of patching that broken relationship. That that's not what the Apostle Paul does. When you read this passage in the Greek, it's super garbled. It doesn't read like a normal passage should because Paul is going out of his way to remind both parties that they have a role to play. It's why you see that verb happen twice. There are two subjects, there are two objects because both Euodia and Syntyche have a role to play in this, uh, in this uh, controversy. It's 50-50. And what Paul does is he takes the shared responsibility of the conflicts, of this conflict, and he points both people towards the love and the grace of Jesus. In other words, conflict is a moment when we can see our own faults and own them. Paul says, I want these people to agree in the Lord, meaning he wants Yodia and Syntyche to apply God's grace to themselves. He wants them to reflect on what he just wrote before in Philippians chapter 2 about, about love, about Jesus and his example, preferring the needs of others before himself. He wants Yodi and Syntyche to take those resources to their disagreement, to own where they're wrong, and then to apologize for it. Every time we are in conflict with someone, it's an opportunity for us to identify and repent of the weaknesses that are inherent of our character. And this is, in fact, a tool that grows us in Christ. And may, may I say that this doesn't get the other person off the hook, right? They still wronged you. They have still things to, to, to own up in their own life. But you can't control what they do, can you? All you can do, all any of us can do, is own our part in the conflict, Right, to be okay with our weaknesses, to own them, to repent of them, and then to ask forgiveness for them. And when we do this, oftentimes that's the first step for reconciliation to happen. And as a pastor, this is something that I even practice myself. This is the first step that Paul invites us into. We need to assume shared guilt, but that's not all. Paul also asks us to assume that Jesus died for the person that we are in conflict with. 
So let's just read Philippians 4, 3, especially the end of Philippians 4, 3, where the Apostle Paul says this. He reminds all parties involved that their names are written in the book of life. Meaning that Jesus has died for this person. This person that you're in conflict with has full assurance of heaven one day. Right? They're accepted by God. They're covered by Jesus. They're fully forgiven in God's eyes. In other words, the right way to see the person that we are in conflict with is not as our enemy, but as someone who's dear and precious to God. As someone, in fact, who Jesus has died for to redeem. And so let's just say you're in conflict with someone in the church right now, or let's just say you're in conflict with someone in your family right now, right? What your responsibility, what your responsibility is to them is to see them fundamentally as someone who Jesus has died for. And this restricts the anger that we innately feel. Again, it's the most intuitive thing in the human psyche to be in conflict with someone and then to just construct a narrative out of thin air that shows you how wrong that person is. And this builds up our anger towards that person. It builds up our justification for being angry at that person. And Paul says, wait, do you realize that this is someone who Jesus has died for? And that reality constricts our anger and prevents that internal narrative from being cast negatively against them. When individuals disagree... They are always shaping each other. We need to understand this reality, especially within the church. Anytime we disagree with a brother or sister in Christ, we are always shaping them in one of two directions. We are either shaping them more into grace, more into mercy, more in in their capacity to love what Jesus has done for them, or we're shaping them in the opposite direction, depending on our interaction with them. I know many, many Christians who have been turned off to the church because when in disagreement, someone has just burned every bridge that's there. They've harbored grudges. They've been petty. They've been prideful. And because of that, it's driven people away from the church. It's driven people away from Jesus. Anytime we are in conflict with someone, we have the capacity to either turn them on to Jesus or turn them away from Jesus. And so Paul is asking us to pause and to realize that the person we are in conflict with, Jesus has died for that person, and we need to treat them accordingly. And again, that doesn't get them off the hook, but it certainly reframes the way that we think about them. C.S. Lewis has a a beautiful way of articulating the way we need to think about our brothers and sisters in Christ. He wrote it in an essay called The Weight of Glory. You can probably actually find it free online someplace if you just Google The Weight of Glory free PDF. This is how I spend most of my Sunday afternoons. You can read it in like 20 minutes. It's wonderful. But this is how he concludes his reflection on the weight of glory that all of us carry. C.S. Lewis says this, Remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to in church may one day be a creature of unimaginable glory in heaven or utter ruin in eternal destruction. All day long, we are in some degree helping each other to one or the other of these destinations. It is in in the light of these overwhelming possibilities. It is with the awe and the circumspection proper to them that we should conduct all of our dealings with one another, all friendships, all loves, all play, all politics. There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilizations, those things are mortal, but it is immortals with whom we joke, work, marry, snub, and exploit. And we have the capacity to direct them either towards immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. I think this is a a sobering word of advice for us as we by nature get into conflict with each other. And may I, again, may may I dissolve this reality that conflict is in itself a bad thing or disagreement is in itself a bad thing. Disagreeing with someone in the church is not in itself a bad thing. It's what we do with that disagreement. Paul is trying to recast the way that we see the people we disagree with so that we can always temper our anger and treat that person with the love and the dignity that God's grace uh, deserves in them. We carry the weight of glory of the people that we are in conflict with, and we need to carry that weight soberly. And last but not least, Paul asks us that we need to assume sometimes that we might need other people to deal with our conflict. Conflict is real, 
right? It hurts us, and sometimes that conflict is very, very deep. And sometimes that conflict is so deep, that hurt, that wounding is so deep that we actually can't sort our way through it without the help of someone else. And Paul realizes this. Again, if you look at Philippians 4, verse 3, we can read this, where Paul is inviting someone else into the conflict to help. He says, yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored by my side. Now, we don't know necessarily who true companion is, and I think that's intentional on Paul's point. Paul is asking true, faithful believers in Christ who are maybe gifted at reconciliation, who are maybe gifted at bringing harmony within two people who disagree. Right? Paul is asking them to walk side by side with them and lead them towards the path of peace. I mean, Jesus himself, before the Sermon on the Mount, would say, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. There are certain people within the church, and maybe some of you are, are these people, who are by nature peacemakers. You're good at bringing peace into a situation. You're good at bringing harmony into a situation. Paul knows that the spiritual giftedness of some people in the church are, is geared that way, and so he asks them to part with these two leaders within the church so that they can finally bury whatever controversy they have. And this is a reality that I think all of us have to wrestle with sometimes. That sometimes we are not strong enough, we're not wise enough, we're not articulate enough to actually make amends with the person that we are in conflict with. It's, this is a very real reality that sometimes we can do everything right. We can do everything right. We can own our 50%. We can repent of it. We can see the other person in light of God's grace. We can show them grace and mercy, and yet they come to the table, and they're absolutely hard-hearted, right? They're unrepentant. In fact, they feel justified in the anger that they're still giving to you. What, what are we to do in some of these situations? Scripture is not without wisdom. Scripture is not, doesn't leave us without any sort of answers, Sometimes we do everything right, and yet, and yet we're still being treated awfully by the person with whom we are in conflict. In that situation, Jesus is very, very clear about the, the protocols for a church, or the protocols to protect people. And it's always really important that when we read these protocols in Matthew 18, that they seem really harsh sometimes, but they're, they're, they're harsh not because Jesus wants to be harsh, but because sometimes protection needs to be strong. And when someone is being harmed, when someone is being wounded, when someone is being traumatized, it oftentimes takes a strong leader to step in between that and make sure that people are protected. But if you want to turn to Matthew 18, verses 15 through 18, we see Jesus lay out exactly what we are supposed to do when someone doesn't want to come to the table, and they feel completely justified in the harm that they're giving someone, and in fact, they won't recant, they won't repent of it. In Matthew 18, this is what Jesus says. If a brother or a sister sins against you, go and tell their faults between you and them alone. And if they listen to you, well, then you have gained a brother or a sister in Christ. Now, let's just pause here and just read this. It is the goal to drag this person you're in conflict with under the table and to completely discredit them? No, of course not. It's, it's, it's not our responsibility to publicly display this person as a sinner. We're, we're supposed to go to them individually in, 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 in the hope of making, making recompense, in the hope of making peace between us and them privately. But sometimes that just doesn't work. And in those scenarios, we are to, to gather other godly men and women in the faith. We are to gather other godly men and women in the church, and we are to invite them into this situation, not to make the other pe person feel horrible, but in order to make amends with that person, the goal is always peace and harmony. The goal is always protection. And when that happens, oftentimes I've seen reconciliation happen. But in 0.001% of situations, sometimes this just happens, where a person won't ask for forgiveness. They won't own what they do. They won't own the fact that they are agent of wounding or harm within the church. And in that case, Jesus says something fairly dramatic. He says, treat them like a tax collector. And at first we're like, oh my goodness, what does that mean, Jesus? How can you be so mean? Until you remember how Jesus treated tax collectors. He was actually fairly kind of towards them. Tax collectors were on the outside of God's community, but Jesus was always welcoming them into the community. And so when Jesus says, I want you to treat them like a tax collector, what he means is this. He says, he, he, he means this. He's like, I want you to protect those who don't see themselves as angels as agents of wounding within the church. I want you to isolate them from the church so that they cannot continue to harm people within the church. 
any time a pastor or someone in leadership deals with someone who is blatantly harming people and yet not owning up to that fact in any way or in any way or shape, any time that happens, they're going to do that over and over and over again. That's habitualized action. You cannot let that happen within the church. Otherwise, the church is just going to be harmed by this person fundamentally. And so what you do is in kindness, in grace, in humility, with a ton of prayer and with a ton of wisdom, you slowly come to the, the realization that this person isn't going to change. And so you ask them very kindly and gently, that they're no longer welcome to be a part of the community because they no longer want to, to be a part of the community. They, they want to they have the liberty to be able to harm whoever they want to, whenever they want to, and that's just not acceptable. And so Jesus says you need to exclude them from the community with the hope that they will be brought back in one day. This is precisely what Jesus did with tax collectors. He loved them, he cared for them, he welcomed them, he welcomed them to the table, and then he asked them to repent. And this is exactly what we are supposed to do when we are in conflict with someone. Inevitably, Jesus is on the side of protecting those who have been wounded. And this, this, this instruction is given for protection. This, is, is, this instruction is given so that we can protect those who are being uncared for within the church. All of this takes lots of time and lots of, lot, lots of wisdom, but it's a good thing to have very gentle authority within the church. And so I know all of this is fairly, fairly heavy, but I wanted to walk through a biblical, a biblical standpoint of what it looks like to deal with controversy within the church. I simply want to conclude with a, maybe a, a, a hopeful reflection. It's so easy when we're in conflict to demonize the person that we are in conflict with. And I think it's so beautiful, it's absolutely beautiful, that Jesus shows us a fundamentally different way to deal with people who we can't seem to agree with. I think we have to own this reality that anger grows, that grudges become hurt feelings, and hurt feelings causes people to take sides. And when people take sides, churches divide. And so Paul speaks directly to this with a word of wisdom for us. I find it is no surprise that Paul concludes this section on church conflict by saying this in Philippians 4, verse 8. He says, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything excellent or worthy of praise, I want you to think about such things. How are we to shape our hearts over time so that when we, when we do get into conflict, we have the natural muscle reflexes to offer grace and gentleness. We have the, 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 the natural spiritual ref reflexes to listen and not be quick with a sharp word. Where do we get the strength to actually forgive? It's in the daily habit of pondering who Jesus is. His love is excellent. His example is pure. His life is worthy of praise. And I find it as no surprise that the, the beautiful example that Jesus gives us is this, is that when the, the, the Roman guards were hammering him to that cross, Jesus wasn't saying, how dare you? And Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And so oftentimes when we're in conflict, and that person who seems like they're wounding us, so often they don't know what they're doing. Wounded people wound people. Hurt people hurt people. Jesus gives us the example of praying for them, of asking for them for their forgiveness. It's, and it's only, it's only when we make a daily habit out of reflecting on, on what is pure, what is excellent, and what is worthy of praise that we actually become people of reconciliation. And we become a community of peace and harmony. And let me tell you, this is precisely what Scarsdale needs. Right? This is precisely what Westchester County needs, is a refreshing alternative community where real reconciliation can happen, whether it's economically, whether it's racially, whether it's sexually. But what, what Westchester County really needs is a community of peace and of harmony that can actually do the real work that Jesus has called us to do. How do we embrace the example that Paul has set before us? It's by pondering. It's by pondering whatever is pure, and lovely and commendable. And with that, let's pray. Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that you have given us a different example for what to do with the anger that we naturally encounter in ourselves, Lord. I thank you that you have given us a counterexample for what to do when we disagree with someone, Lord. Disagreement isn't bad, but it's what we do with that disagreement. Make us people of gentleness. Make us people of kindness. Make us people who are quick to offer forgiveness because we know the forgiveness that we have in you. 
We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. All right, so we are going to continue our time of worship with a moment when we can uh, collect our tithes and our offerings for the glory of God and for the extension of the gospel. And so as cheerful givers, let's present our tithes and offerings together. Jesus, please bless these gifts and offerings to extend your gospel for your glory, for our good, and for the growth of the church. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing our concluding hymn.
here is my benediction for you. Now the God of peace and consolation grant you to be like-minded one towards another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and with one mouth glorify God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go, be blessed, have a wonderful Sunday. Uh, this concludes our services. If you are more gregarious, you are welcome to join us. Uh, in the